please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Friends, please welcome to the stage Jade Lazada. The worst crime I know men have committed is to turn nature into an oppressor. I tend land, concrete gorges in earth, pillared steel and brick, burdenless and guiltless below its sky. The first witness and last native to this island at the joint of the ocean's palm and the Hudson's stretch into us. An exodus from the diaspora for sins of skin darkening for lack of sun and barren pockets. Somewhere we search for home. So we bleed joy into our beating heart labyrinth in barrios. The croon of a singer who never kissed his mother's land good goodbye. Laces and tangles treetops in the night. Glides into the southern current of the sea waters the pores of my concrete. Cascading lyrics from our windows return in lush platano leaves on the sill. When our, when our words melt into English arroyos, pavement, that mutilation of Manhattan Island breaks open nature's bounty. Grotesque, undulating heat reverberates off asphalt ricochets off brick into the heartbeat of car stereos. Diesel clouds halo above us. Toxins pumped from Earth's troves poison our breath. Of their sear on our skin, their imprint on our lungs, their toil in digging deep graves for early deaths. But here will not lie the fate of the First Natives. To be mutilated, as someone's ancestors mutilated Manahatta, raising forests, burying water with families, forcing brown bodies thereafter to swallow oceans in order to taste home. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Jade Lozada, a writer, spoken word artist, poet, and a sophomore at Harvard College. She was a local youth organizer of the 2019 global climate strike, which brought together a record 300,000 people for the planet. Brava, Jade. Thank you for joining Woo! us. I'm just Dan Pasternak. And I'm Cindy Levy, and we're really, really happy to be here with you tonight. Yes, we are. We are here to welcome one of our very long-term idols, and probably yours too. As you'll hear tonight, Dr. Jane Goodall has led an astonishing and self-directed life. And at the age of, as of yesterday, 89, She is living it with a sense of urgency and passion. Today, we all need that same urgency and that passion for this planet. And we are joined in this room by young people, both in the audience and on stage, who are leading us forward. So like Dr. Goodall, these young people are working in so many different ways, in so many different communities, to try to make a future possible for all of us. They're working on ocean issues, they're working on conservation issues. Um, raise your hand and cheer for yourself or your neighbor if you're working on those things. And that's right. We're honored that we're also joined by young people from Dr. Goodall's own Roots and Shoots program, part of the Jane Goodall Institute. Give yourself a big round if you're involved with Roots and Shoots. 
So I want to thank you, Cindy, and everybody at the Meteor. If you are not following the Meteor, you don't know what's going on in terms of equity and justice. So I just want to say thank you for being our partner. We love partnering with the Meteor, and thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, well, back at you, Anne, and it's really lovely to be here at the museum, which always makes such a commitment, not just to art and to artists, but to the world that they live and work in and the world that we're all trying to build. Um, one note, we want to acknowledge that we are standing here just two weeks after a UN report that I'm sure many of you read the headlines about, which found that our planet is speeding toward climate catastrophe even more rapidly than we knew. Our opening speakers in tonight's program are devoting their lives and careers to helping us change that. And first, it's my privilege to welcome Sanchali Paul, the founder and CEO of Commons, whose support for the event we're so grateful for. Welcome, Sanchali. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here in community with all of you and with Dr. Goodall. I know that everyone who's here tonight is here because you have a story about why you care about continuing the beauty of life on Earth. And I'm here to tell you some of my story. I started tracking my carbon footprint in college because I was looking to see if there was any connection between the choices I made in my personal life and the big economic systems I cared about changing. I couldn't find any good carbon tools online, so I ended up building out my own. And over six years, I lowered my carbon footprint by 30%. I also saved money, and I was happier because my life was more in line with my values. Along that time, my choices led me to working and living in Eth India and Ethiopia, working on international development. When I was there, I was seeing the effects of the climate crisis firsthand on real people's lives, and that motivated me to try to find a solution at scale. So a few years ago, I started Commons. It was based on a vision. A question, what if all of us tracked our carbon emissions and we use that information to make more intentional choices about our shared resources? What would the world look like? The stark new UN climate report that we just talked about tells us that the window to make meaningful change for our planet is closing. We have just 12 years until 2035 to cut global emissions by 65% and prevent the most catastrophic effects of the climate crisis. Our personal choices can't change everything. We still need policy change. But consumer spending does influence 65% of global emissions. And those of us with higher incomes have greater power and responsibility to make a change. All of us transact in the carbon economy every day. It's just invisible to us. Every single one of us made a choice tonight about how to get here, for instance. We might have taken the subway, we taken a taxi, or walked. But the carbon impact of those choices is invisible to us. We have no good tools for measuring and managing our collective emissions together. Making carbon emissions visible to individuals and helping us make more sustainable choices together is what Commons does. That's how we pressure companies. Whether it's skipping a flight, shopping more secondhand, switching to a greener bank, together we can shape a more sustainable world. So I want to leave you with two things tonight. The first is an offering. Commons has taken the step to offset the emissions of this entire event tonight. That includes the energy emissions of, that we're using here tonight and estimating the emissions of our transport to and from this event um, by supporting climate projects around the world that draw down carbon emissions. You can learn more about those projects on our website. Second, I want to give you an invitation. An, invita an invitation to join me in Commons today. So you can download the app using the QR code on the screen. You can follow me, Sanchali Paul, and after this event, we can inspire and motivate each other in our climate journeys. Tonight, we all get to speak with Dr. Goodall, who shows us the ability of an individual to make a lasting change. Uh, this gathering also inspires me. Every one of us, young, old, business people, activists, we are the ones who are gonna rebalance the commons. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanchali. Uh, we're proud to know you. And I'm really excited to introduce you to our next speaker. At just 24 years old, Aisha Siddiqui is already one of the world's leading environmental activists. She's the co-founder of, co of Polluters Out. 
She serves as a climate advisor to the UN Secretary General, no big deal, and she was just named one of Time Magazine's Women of the Year this month. Wow. Yeah, and she'll be joined on stage by Treasure Brooks, who actually has the best name ever, right? A filmmaker, cultural strategist, and a founding member of The Meteor. Please welcome Aisha and Treasure to the stage. We heard earlier about the new data on how rapidly our climate is warming, but I want to help us get a little bit more clear on what that actually looks like. Every five minutes, the Earth loses 12 million tons of ice. It's melting and fast. Just like the cube of ice, I'll be holding in my hand over the next five minutes as I speak to the illustrious Aisha Sadika. Aisha, can you believe that, 12 million tons? I can't, and it's unfortunate. <laughs> and she's the expert. So, you know how quickly things can change in five minutes? Ready to jump into it? Let's go, let's do it. Okay, Ooh, it's going quick. First question, <laughs> what or perhaps who is most at risk in the climate catastrophe? The climate catastrophe or the climate crisis is not gender blind. It's not race blind, it's not class blind. It uses the pre-existing structures of hierarchy to further put people into danger. And those people are most at risk. So in a given society like the one that we live in today, it's people on the, that are experiencing the worst of the housing crisis. It's people who are experiencing poverty. It's people who are experiencing hunger and they will face the worst effects of climate crisis because where will they go when they don't have a home to live anymore? Where will they go when they don't have access to clean water? And as uh, inflation increases and food prices increases, where will they get their sustenance? Mm, very insightful, thank you. I wanna ask you how being raised in tribal communities impacts your climate activism? So I was raised in a tribal community in Pakistan and that distinction is very uh, specific because indigeneity is not monolithic. Indigeneity as it, ex it is experienced in the Americas is not the same as it is in Africa and it's not the same as it is in Asia. In fact, the Asian continent is home to the most amount of indigenous peoples on planet Earth and also home to um, so, uh, a large um, amount of people who are involved in conservation. So being raised in a tribal community from a very, very early age, I did not have a concept of personal property. Mm -hmm. And that's because the way that our homes were structured, organized in our architecture, to the, the way that we had access to uh, food and nutrients, um, to, to our animals, to the uh, livestock that provided us us with milk and even raising children it was done with hand in hand with 20 to 25 people and that has played a really really big role in my um, ability and also need to protect planet earth because I was raised by people who were doing it long before I was born and um, my grandfather in, in, in the tribal community um, we we still protect our waterways. And the way that works is uh, we carve streams for the water when it, it, it's overflowing. And when it's starting to dry up, we help narrow the streams. And this also helps the patterns of the fish that are traveling and the migration of the animals. Um, and this is taught to children. At, uh, each elder takes an apprentice. The same goes with keeping our memory and story alive. Each elder takes an apprentice. We treasure not only protection of the earth, we teach it to our young from a very, very early age, and which is one of the reasons why I'm here today. Mm. So your upbringing shows you another way is possible. So how about you tell everyone the question that's on all of our minds, what is the solution? Mm. I think it would be remiss if I got on stage here today and, and did not tell you that the solution starts with the deproliferation of fossil fuels. Absolutely. And I use the word deproliferation because the fossil fuel industry 
as it exacerbates, is becoming a industry that is allowing ecocide, mm -hmm. genocide, ethnocide, from the mining that is happening in the Brazilian Amazon to the hydro dams that are being built in Pakistan to the uh, plastics industry that is shoving its foot down the throats of our African brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. The fossil fuel industry is setting our planet on fire. And if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't speak it, we're going to let our planet and, and all the life that it inhabits um, deplete. Can we just get a round of applause for that? Thank you so much. So Aisha, there are people in the audience and at home 10, maybe 15 years younger than us watching the work you're doing. What do you have to say to them? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people look at young people for hope, and um, to the young people younger than me that are sitting there, I know climate anxiety is real. I know the stress is real. And not only is it real, it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. It's not that you are crazy or experiencing something that is abnormal. Actually, it's very normal. It shows that you have a connection to planet. In fact, in, uh, in my culture, the elders teach us that young people, the reason why they are so, sub so subsep susceptible to the emotion and calls of planet Earth is because they are closer to the beginning of life. Mm. And the generation that is coming forth right now will see the aftermath of the climate crisis with their very eyes. The generation I stand in is in between. And we have the ability to change the, sh the course of the ship, which makes the responsibility that much more higher. But um, my, my uh, message to, to the young people is don't become apathetic to this. Don't become apathetic to the pain that you can feel and also use it to build hope. Well, thank you, so well said. The ice in my hand is melting and it is absolutely freezing. <laughs> As are the glaciers around our world. What gives you hope that we can stop this? I was raised with the belief that the earth is a living being. And because she is a living being, she has given birth to her guardians all over the planet, very consciously. And it's not a coincidence that they're arising from all different parts of the world and coming together with the message that is the same. See, at this moment in time, in history, the scientific prophecies, the religious prophecies, the spiritual prophecies are all the same. We're running out of time. And what gives me hope is people waking up to that, realizing that you are just but a species on planet Earth that your time will also come, and you must leave it and, and the, the place that you call home behind better for the generations that are to come. We must be good ancestors, not because it's our responsibility to those in the future, but because it is the rent we play, pay to live here. And it is a beautiful, beautiful miracle of a planet where we live on. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. We must be good ancestors. Thank you, Aisha Sadiqa. It's been an amazing journey, this life of mine. This planet has filled me with the wonder of all living things, great and small. We cannot ignore this earth that surrounds us that feeds us, shelters us, replenishes our bodies and our souls, and stretches our imaginations, where animals, plants, air, water, all care for us. We're all interconnected. People, animals, our environment. When nature suffers, we suffer. And when nature flourishes, we all flourish. I do believe in the possibility of a world where we can live in harmony with nature, but only if every one of us does our part to make that world a reality.
so that when you look back over your journey, your life, you can truly say, I did not. Friends, let's get straight to it. We are awed, thrilled, and honored down to our bones to introduce our guest of honor. Um, she has profoundly changed the way we understand the animal world, which is to say the world world, and through her groundbreaking work, not just in Kenya and Tanzania, but globally, she's encouraged a new generation of thinkers and visionaries and activists to follow in her footsteps. And she will be joined in conversation with the writer and illustrator Mona Chalubi, a founding member of The Meteor whose work helps us understand the world. And you may know of Mona's work from her art installation on the steps of the Brooklyn Museum just last year. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Jane Goodall and Mona Chalabi. to start saying thank you for a fantastic welcome. Um, uh, it was wonderful to hear the young people speaking before, but I think the welcome you gave me deserves a very special welcome from me, which you might hear if you came with me to Tanzania to the Gombe National Park. And it's... <laughs> Chimpanzee for This Is Me, This Is Jane. <laughs> well, Dr. Goodall, I was going to start out by saying we are thrilled to have you here, but I think you already know that by now. <laughs> um, I'm going to dive straight in with the questions, if that's okay. And I wanted to start out a little bit before we get to Tanzania by talking about your childhood. So you had a very, very early love for animals. Can you tell us where that came from? Well, people always ask me where my love of animals came yeah. from. I don't know. I was <laughs> born, I popped out of my mother's womb loving animals. And she tells me that when I was one and a half, I don't remember, but she came up to say goodnight to me and I just got this whole handful of wriggling earthworms and their earth in my bed. And, you know, so many mothers would have just said, oh, throw those dirty things out. Yeah. But she said, Jane, you were looking at them as though you were wondering, how do they walk without legs? Yeah. And she just quietly said, I think we'd better take them in the garden because they might die in your bed. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I was literally born and I spent my childhood. You know, there was no TV when I was growing up. Yeah. A lot of young people can't imagine a world without yeah. TV. Yeah. In Pakistan, I'm sure they can. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I had nature out in the garden, on the cliffs near my home, and books. And yeah. so there were birds and squirrels, and there were the dogs and the cats. That's, that was my teachers. And then, and then to fast forward a little bit, when you first entered the field, you didn't necessarily have the most conventional educational background. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, when I was 10 years old, um, I read Tarzan of the Apes. <laughs> and I, we didn't have much money, but I used to go to this little second-hand bookshop. Mm -hmm. Most books came from the library. But I had saved up, I used to save up my pennies of pocket money. And I had just enough to buy this little book. It was second-hand called Tarzan of the Apes. So I took it home, I took it up my favorite tree, I read it from cover to cover, and you know, little girls of 10 can be very romantic. <laughs> and I fell passionately in love with this glorious Lord of the Jungle. And what did he do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> right? 
So, of course, I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I would grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. No yeah. thought of being a scientist. Yeah. That wasn't for women back then. And everybody laughed at me. How yeah. would you get to Africa? Yeah. It's far away. It's, we don't know much about it. It's full of dangerous wild animals. And you're just a girl. Yeah. But my mother, Jane, if you really want to do something like this, then you have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, yeah. and if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. And I've taken that around the world, particularly young people in disadvantaged communities, especially girls, mm. boys too, and how many have written and said, Jane, thank you, you've taught me because you followed your dream and did it, I can follow mine. Yeah. Was <laughs> Well, I have to say, some of the sexism that you describe was quite apparent in some of the early write-ups of your work. I've got some of these headlines here. Uh, blonde ogles apes, uh, young, blonde and beautiful, and a scientific whiz. Um, they seem quite fixated on the fact that you were blonde. Uh, uh, did it bother you to be receiving that kind of coverage at the time? Well, you know, when I finally got to Africa, it was because I... Uh, I had to do a secretarial course first because I had to have a job, mm. couldn't afford university. And then I got this job in London. I got a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya. And uh, so that was opportunity. But money, I couldn't save money in London where my job was. I worked as a waitress at home and it's jolly hard work. Yeah. It took four to five months to save up enough. And finally I got there. And then I heard about the famous paleontologist, anthropologist, Lewis Leakey. Somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. And so I went to meet him at the Natural History Museum. He was curator. And, it, you know, I took this boring secretarial course in London, but you never know yeah. when something's important. His secretary had just quit. Wow. He needed a secretary. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm in a world where I'm surrounded by people who can answer all my questions about, mm. about animals, about m mammals and birds and reptiles and insects and plants. And it was total magic. Yeah. And that job ultimately is what got you to Kenya and then Tanzania. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of first encounters that you had with chimpanzees once you arrived? Yeah, well, Leaky, you know, eventually asked me... He, he decided I was the right person yeah. to go and study chimpanzees. He'd looked for somebody for years. They're our closest relatives. And, you know, he was studying early humans, and he felt mm. that understanding our closest relatives in the wild could be useful. And finally he got the money, and I got to Gombe. I wasn't allowed to go alone by the then British authorities. And Too so, dangerous. again, my mother volunteered to come. So wow. I had money for just six months. Hard to get, I had yeah. no degree. And she came for four. And you know, she, she, she really helped me to get over the first four months when you asked me to describe my encounters mm. with chimps. It was seeing their backsides vanishing into the forest. <laughs> they were, you know, they're very, very shy yeah. and they'd never seen a white upright ape before. Yeah. And we are the fifth great ape. Mm -hmm. We seriously, biologically are. And so I was getting more and more depressed because, you know, the money was going to run out. I would let Lewis Leakey down. I knew with time I could get the chimps trust, but did I have the time? Mm. And then one of them, whom I named David Greybeard because he had a white bristly chin and was terribly handsome. <laughs> and he began to lose his fear for some reason before the others. And oh. so it was really thanks to David Greybeard that I managed to uh, see exciting things and the geographic stepped in to say they would fund the research when my money ran out. Do you, do you remember that first encounter when David kind of let down his guard and started to trust well, you? Well, it, it, I, I was, it was just sadly two weeks after my mother left. Mm. Uh, you know, she'd boosted my morale all those months saying you're learning from your binoculars. I knew it wasn't enough. And, but she left just before I was walking along this trail and I saw David and I saw him reach out, pick stem of grass, scratch at a little place on the termite mound 
open up one of the passages and push the tool down, pull it carefully out, wow. termites biting on with their mandibles, and eat them off. And then he picked a leafy twig, and to use that as a tool, he had to strip the side branches and the leaves. So at that time, science had decided humans, and only humans, mm -hmm. could use and make tools. We were defined as man, of course it was man in those days, yes. man the tool user. Yeah. And so it was that observation that brought the geographic in with money for me to carry on. So David, I owe him a lot. It's incredible. But that wasn't the only revolutionary discovery that you made. The thinking at the time was also that humans were the only animals that had personalities, right? And your work started to uncover something different. Yes, well, you know, after, after that first observation, because David came to trust me, I could get closer to the other chimps. They sort of looked from him to me, and I think they decided I must be not so scary mm -hmm. as they thought. And so I, I began to learn their vivid personalities. I learned about the relationships with mothers and their growing offspring. Mm -hmm. I learned about the, uh, the um, dominance conflict between males when the male will stand upright and have a furious scowl on his face and shake his fist. And it's all, you know, about show. And it reminds me so much of two male human politicians. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't say a name, did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, they kiss, embrace, hold hands, mm. pat one another. Of course, Leakey was thrilled because that enabled him to think, well, that's what early humans probably did. Yeah. They used grass tools long before the first toad stone tools were discovered. Yeah. And so uh, it was a shock to find that they also have a dark, brutal side to their nature. They live in communities, the males patrol the territories, and sometimes there's a sort of primitive war. And they kill each other mm. over territory. Mm. And, but they also have a compassionate and altruistic side. Just those that are just like us. And so, no, no, I'm sorry. Now no, we're going to answer you. your yeah. question now after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I was just about to say some of that compassionate side becomes visible when you watch them as parents. I think we even have a photo of, um, I think it might be a, a, a chimpanzee, maybe with a child, maybe. Um, I was actually going to ask you what were well, this, that was. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. um, I was That's going mother, to ask, mother this. I, I'm not sure if it's a, yeah, it is, a yes. mother and child. Yes, it's a mother, mother and child. Yeah. And the, you know, the mother doesn't have her first child till she's about 13. One baby every five years. She does not overpopulate her environment. Mm -hmm. And um, the, when the next child is born, the five-year-old still stays with the mother, mm -hmm. forms bonds with the little baby. And then even when the next child is born, the eldest one still spends a lot of time with the family. Wow. So these bonds last through life between mother, offspring, brothers and sisters. And, you know, so if, if the mother dies then the little orphan may actually be adopted by an unrelated male, which shows true altruism. If there's an, an older brother or sister, automatically they will adopt the mm. infant who will survive providing he or she is at least three years old. Up to then, they depend on their mother's milk. It's a very long childhood. Yeah. They have a lot to learn. Wow. Can I ask what watching them... It sounds like watching them taught you a lot about parenting perhaps but also it sounds like it taught you something about grief maybe as well yes uh, we the, one of the famous examples was when the oldest chimpanzee mother we know Flo mm. she was one of the great characters along with David Greybeard and some of the others and she had an eight year old son well he was unusually dependent Flo had had another infant after him and that infant died and so Flo took Flint back, you know, and allowed him to continue suckling, even though by then he was six years old. Mm -hmm. And when he was eight, he was still riding on her back, although sometimes she fell because she was old. Uh, she, yeah. was, she was about 50. Wow. And sometimes he wanted her to groom him, and he was always pulling her hand. He pestered and pestered her. And when she died, he, I think he died of grief. 
like the, the most sad scene I saw, because I was following him, and I'd watched them before, just before she died. She made a big nest up in the tree, and they slept there together. And so after she died, he sat for a long time, huddled up, and then on, I think it was about the third day, he climbed that tree, he walked along to that nest, and he stood looking at it, and then he turned and climbed back down, curled up on the bank of the stream and died. Oh my God. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I, it, it's hard, I think, to go from some of those examples to, to your work that is now actually so focused on hope. Can I ask some of the journey about how you, how you got there, how you ended up focusing on climate change specifically and eventually this, this, um, this book? Yes, it's very interesting, yeah. but can I finish answering your question yes, that you asked of course, before? Yes, yeah. Which was, um, you know, when I'd been with the chimps for some time, two mm. years, Leakey said I had to go and get a degree because mm. he wanted other scientists to treat me, you know, respectfully, not just pretty girl ogles, apes, or whatever <laughs> yeah. you quoted. Yeah. And he sent me to Cambridge to get a PhD. He said there was no time for an undergraduate degree. And <laughs> when, yeah, sorry guys, but anyway. <laughs> so imagine how I felt, I was nervous. Yeah. And the professor said, uh, you've done everything wrong. You shouldn't have given the chimps names. It's not scientific to number them. And you can't talk about their personality, their minds or their emotions. Mm. Those are unique to us. And luckily, I told you I had animals when I was young. And my special animal friend, Rusty, my dog, had taught me that the professors were wrong. Yeah. You can't share your life in a meaningful yeah. way. I bet many of you have had a dog or a cat, a horse or something, and you know we're not the only sentient, sapient beings yeah. on the planet. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I jumped away. No, now I'll, not at all. Now I'll go back to the next question you asked me. Well, actually, which was, while we're talking about names, can you tell me who, who these are that are oh, right here in front of us? Well, actually, these, these come after the question you just asked okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I was, I, the, the question I had asked earlier was about <laughs> climate change activism yeah, and how you right, started to right, notice these right, connections. So, yeah, um, I hope you're happy with this. I am more than happy, <laughs> Dr. Goodall. I'm more than happy. Because I'm being kind of mean. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to get things in my own mind. It's, it's me. So why did I leave the forest that mm. I loved? Why did I leave the forest where I learned about the interconnection of all the plants and animals and trees, each with a role to play, mm. forming this amazing forest ecosystem? The ecosystems we're destroying yes. around the world, along with the ocean, the two great lungs of the planet. Anyway, I left because in 1986, I learned at a big conference that right across Africa, chimpanzee, chimpanzee numbers were dropping and forests were being destroyed. And I just felt, you know, I had my PhD by then, but I needed to try and do something about it. I didn't know what to do. It got to visit, by then there were six other field study sites where people were studying chimps. I visited them all. Mm. I learned a lot about the problems faced by chimps, the bushmeat trade, shooting mothers to sell their babies overseas for circuses, entertainment, pets, and in those days, medical research. And, but I also learned about the problems of so many of the people living in and around chimpanzee habitat. You know, the crippling poverty, the lack of good education and health facilities, the degradation of the land as their populations grew, and the populations of the livestock moving into the forest, the chimpanzee habitat. And when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, where, by the way, we're in our 63rd year of studying the chimps, one of the three longest term studies mm -hmm. of wild animals in the world. And when I began in 1960, it was part of this great forest that stretched across equatorial Africa. When I flew over in the late 1980s, I was shocked. It was an island of forest, a little national park, and it was surrounded by bare hills. And there were more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere cutting down the trees because in their desperation to survive, they needed to make more land to grow more food and, or to make money from charcoal or timber. And that's when it hit me. 
If we don't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimpanzees, forests, or anything else. Yeah. And so the Jane Goodall Institute began a program, we call it Takari. It's very holistic. I won't go into it now because there isn't time. But it began in the three villages around uh, Gombe. And the one thing I will say is it wasn't a bunch of arrogant white people going into a very poor African village and telling them what to mm. do. It was a team of carefully selected local Tanzanians. And they went into the villages and asked the people, what could we do to make your lives better? Yeah. Well, grow more food. That meant restoring fertility to the overused farmland mm -hmm. without chemicals, by the way. And um, better health and education programs, working with the Tanzanian, the local Tanzanian authorities that should have been doing it anyway. We kind of prodded them. And then they came to trust us so we could introduce water management, scholarships to give girls a chance of secondary education, mm -hmm. um, microfinance opportunities so people could start their own environmentally sustainable uh, small businesses, mm -hmm. and family planning, very eagerly received because people know that t to get out of poverty one way is good education for your children. And when I got to Gombe, eight to 10 children per woman was average, and they couldn't afford to educate them anymore. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like there was a receptive audience to some of that work, but in some of your climate change work, the audience isn't necessarily quite so receptive. I mean, you, you once told Time magazine, I don't ever want to appear holier than thou. If you tell people you've got to stop doing that, they immediately don't want to talk to you. So can I ask, what do you say instead? <laughs> Well, I feel very strongly that, the, that people must change from within. To get yeah. real change, they must feel they want to change. Mm. So if I'm meeting a oh, climate change denier or somebody who I, fe I feel, rightly or wrongly, uh, doesn't think the way I do about what we should do to save the planet, first of all, try and find a connection. Maybe we both love dogs. Mm. Maybe we both have grandchildren, something, anything. And then talk a little bit. My mother taught me, always listen, because you might learn something you never thought of before. And then how to reach the heart, rather than the head. It's got to start there. And for me, that's through storytelling, mm. because that's the way I, I feel that. And, and it works, because I've got, I could tell you so many examples. Oh, tell us one. Tell us one of an example where you really, really hit someone in their heart and managed to change their minds. Well. When I first went into medical research labs, yeah. uh, it was some of the hardest things I've ever, ever had to do. Mm. Our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages, maybe for 30, 40 years. It stopped now. Francis Collins, the last director of NIH, um, I had long talks with him, and eventually he said they have to go to sanctuary because none of the work we're doing is beneficial to human health. Wow. Um, so there, yeah. That's so anyway, yeah. so uh, when I went into the labs, I came out, and the first time, all the head guys doing animal research in NIH were sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling shocked and shattered, and actually, you know, and they were all sitting around the table, and I realized they were waiting for me to speak. So I thought, what can I say? So into my mind came, you're all caring and compassionate people. You must feel just as I do about what's going on in there. And they could hardly admit they weren't caring and compassionate. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then I just showed them pictures of the Gombe mm -hmm. chimps. And I could see them turning inward. I could see them thinking. Yeah. And you know, I talked to some of these uh, researchers, and they'd never seen a chimp. They just asked for a little vial of blood or, or serum. Or so, data. Yes. Yeah. So I said to them, well, if I give you a book, will you read it? And they said yes. And some of them turned around and, and really helped. The labs got better. And now, as I say, they're finished. Yeah. So, but, you know, 
I don't know if that's a good example, but it's one example. It absolutely is. Yeah. And, it, and it brings us on to the theme, which I know that you wanted to talk about, which is hope. Um, I'm going to show a picture of one thing that I know gives you hope, which is um, this is a photo of Roots and Shoots, which is the program of the Jane Goodall Institute, which has started out with just... <laughs> <laughs> It started out with just 12 children and has now become this enormous network in over 60 countries. So can I ask you what's hopeful about, about working with these young people? Yes. Well, the reason it began, I talked about Takari. Yes. That program is now in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania and in six other countries where JGI works with chimps. Mm. And it was getting rather expensive, and I was traveling around the world talking about Africa's problems. And I kept meeting young people who were losing hope, even back then, that's the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. And they were either angry, sometimes violent, or they were depressed, mostly just apathetic, not seeming to care. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them in all these different countries, why do you feel like this? I mean, I think I knew, but I asked them. And they more or less all said the same, you've compromised our future, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, not a, there's a lot of young people here. Mm -hmm. We have compromised your future. In fact, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been stealing your future, and we're still stealing it today. But is it too late to do something? That's where I disagreed with them. I think we've got this window of time when, if we get together. That's why for me now, Roots and Shoots is so desperately important. Yeah. So it began with these 12 high school students and they were concerned about different things around them. And they asked me if I could you know, help solve them. So I said, well, you're Tanzanian. I love Tanzania, but I'm not Tanzanian. Get your friends together who feel like you do. They were concerned about um, animals being killed in the national parks. Why wasn't the government doing something about it? The illegal dynamite fishing, which was destroying the coral reefs. Children homeless, sniffing glue in the street. Why didn't people look after them? Children throwing stones at stray dogs. They were concerned about all different things. So we had this group of about 30 children, and Roots and Shoots was born with the main message Every individual makes an impact on the planet every single day, and we get a choice as to what sort of impact we make. Mm -hmm. And we decided because of the interconnection of all life that each group would choose. They would choose. We wouldn't, it wasn't top down. Yeah. Although, as we now have members in kindergarten, they need some oh. help. <laughs> but um, basically choosing a project to help people a project to help animals, a project to help the environment, or a project that encompasses all three. Yeah. And so from that group of 12 high school, we are kindergarten, very strong in university, even adults now forming groups like staff of a big corporation. And it's actually got to 68 countries, hundreds and thousands of young people, passionate young people, We've got the alumni who went through Roots and Shoots in school and have grown up to retain the values of respect and compassion, which kind of comes out of Roots and Shoots. And so we're, we're, we're actually developing compassionate citizens for tomorrow. And when, they, when young people understand the problem and they're empowered to take action, they are dedicated, committed, passionate, and that's what gives me hope. And it's not just that they can do things to make the world better, they're doing them. Yeah. They are changing the world, even as we speak. You know, and then nature's so resilient, no more bare hills around Gombe, mm -hmm. the people have planted a few trees, nature has come back, and trees have grown up from seeds that were left in the soil. Places we've basically destroyed, nature will come back if we give her a chance. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance if we perhaps help them along. And, uh, you know, the indomitable spirit. And that's why I have Mr. H, because he, will, he was 32 years old yesterday on my birthday. Wow. 
He was given to me 30, well, 32 years ago. And the person who gave him to me was called Gary Horn, which is why he's Mr. H. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee. And I made him hold the tail. Gary Horn is blind. Mm. He went blind at 21 uh, in the US Marines. For some peculiar reason, he decided to become a magician. And uh, everybody said he couldn't be one, but the children don't know he's blind. And then he'll tell them and say, well, something might happen to you, we never know. If it does, don't give up. There's always a way forward. So not only is he a wonderful magician, but he also does skydiving. He's taught himself to paint. There's an amazing picture of Mr. H in his little book called Blind Artist. And he's never seen him, he's only felt him. Mm. And of course, this tail business, I made Gary hold the tail. I said, Gary, chimps don't have tails. Oh. And so he said, never mind, take him where you go and you know my spirit's with you. So oh. he's been with me to 62 countries. He's incredibly <laughs> famous, Mr. H. Thank you. <laughs> And very quickly, you asked about these other guys. Yeah. Well, you know, that it was that time when I went to university and was told that only humans have personalities, mm. minds, and emotions. And it, it obviously, it's not just chimpanzees and elephants and whales that have high intellect. And it's certainly not just those creatures and us that have personalities. I mean, anybody who's had animals knows that animals have different personalities. And um, certainly, they have emotions, happiness, sadness, and fear. Mm -hmm. So emo there's intellect, there's a huge lot of studying about intellect now. Rats, okay, rats in New York are hated. <laughs> but you know what? It's your fault. You waste food and let it lie around, yeah. and so the rats breed, of course, because there's food for them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, ratty is a giant forest rat, and they have been trained in Tanzania to detect landmines that have been left behind after civil wars mm -hmm. in places like Mozambique, Angola, and so on. And because they're so light, they never set them off. I've watched them being trained, and they're amazing, and they're just, they're just such lovely creatures. Uh, <laughs> you, you can actually Google it, but it's, it, it's amazing. And then, of course, there's the octopus. This is Octavia. And some of you may have seen my octopus teacher, but it turns out that mm. octopus, yeah. yes, it is. <laughs> that, that guy, Gar um, uh, Craig Foster, is my closest email friend now. Oh. But anyway, um, Octavia is, is uh, what I use when I'm talking about octopus intelligence. You know, one tiny brain in the center of the forehead, and then brains in each of the eight arms, so they can operate independently of each That's other. Incredible. And, well, I could tell so many stories <laughs> about octopus intelligence, well, it, but it, it, one <laughs> lovely one, and a wild octopus was first seen, and she's going across open sand. Octopus like to be in rocks because they're soft-bodied. Mm. But so she's going across this open sand, and, you know, they've got eight arms, so two arms on each side were holding half empty coconut shells. And she gets out to where she wants to be for fishing, where there's fish going back and forth. She puts one half on the ground. She oozes herself into it because they, they can go in tiny spaces with their soft bodies. She reaches out, puts the other one over the top. She's now hidden. You just wow. see two eyes peeping out. An unsuspecting fish swims by and pull. So that's just one example of octopus intelligence. It, it and then cow. <laughs> Imaginative name, sorry, but this is yeah. cow. <laughs> and I use cow to illustrate the horror of factory farms mm -hmm. because... <laughs> all these billions of animals that we crowd into these cruel concentration camps for animals, they need to be fed. So masses of land is set aside to grow corn to feed them, grain to feed them. Lots of it, um, fossil fuel is used to cart the, the grain and the animals around. And they all produce methane gas, which is a very virulent greenhouse gas, mm. along with CO2. But 
on top of that, you have to realize every one of those animals, the cows and the pigs and the chickens, they're individuals. They can feel fear and pain. And they have personalities and characters, although they can't express them. Yeah. So those, that's why I have my little family <laughs> of uh, animals. Oh. No surprise, I still feel like people reacted better to the octopus and the cow than the rats, but that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> Might take a bit of convincing for the New Yorkers. Um, I actually wanted to turn to some of the audience questions now, if that's okay. I'm really excited that there are some pe questions from young people here as well. So we have India, age 10, who's actually here with us tonight. Um, if you want to give us a little wave, India. Hi, India. Hello. Um, so, if it's okay, I'm going to ask your question for you. Is that okay? Just because there's no microphones. Thank you, India. Um, so, your question was, I read about Passion, the chimpanzee who was bad. What did you learn from that? Well, Thank you. <laughs> Passion was bad because she definitely killed six infants of other females, very tiny, just after they were born, and probably two more. We think she killed ten infants and ate them. So, she was a cannibal. And we did not know why she did it. And she was a very bad mother. She treated her offspring horribly. Um, and so we thought it was just her, that she was a psychopath. Mm. Since then, sadly, we've seen other females, high-ranking females. It's only when the infant is very tiny. And I've wondered and wondered, is it because that little creature doesn't smell like like a member of the community, because mm. they hate others? Or is it the blood left over from the birthing? That, uh, because they do hunt and yeah. they do eat. Yeah. But, you know, we don't know. Well, I hope that answers your question, India. <laughs> but the, but um, India, there are other chimps who, I mean, there's nice chimpanzees yeah. and unpleasant ones, just like people. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, so when people ask me what my favorite animal is, they all think I'm going to say chimpanzee. But it's not true. They're too like people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my favorite animal is a dog. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have another question from online user Taste in Music, who is watching on the live stream right now. And Avery, age eight, who I also think is here. Avery, maybe? Yeah, hi, Avery, hi. Um, so you both had similar questions, you and this person who asked online. So the question was, is it okay if I ask it as well? Thank you. Um, why did you study chimpanzees instead of any other animal? And other than, than David Greybeard, who was your favorite chimp to watch? Okay, well, I, I didn't choose chimps. They chose me in a way. It was chimpanzees. Leaky asked me to study. I would have studied any animal, any. I just wanted to be out in the world studying wild animals in the African bush. And lo and behold, I got the most fascinating of all, you know, our closest. Li we share 98.6% of the composition of our DNA with chimpanzees, which, of course, is why they were used in medical research. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. But... Um, uh, other than David Greybeard, who was your favorite? it's very yeah. hard to say who was my favorite. I mean, I loved old Flo with her ragged ears and her bulbous nose. And, you know, she was such a dominant female. If anybody dared uh, threaten one of her own offspring, even when she was nearly 60, she would stick a few moth-eaten hairs on end and charge them, and they'd just turn and flee. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also very fond of of um, old Mr. McGregor uh, with his nearly bald head. And I, oh, there were so many. I mean, I, was, I, I loved so many of them. So I, I can't really say. It's like when you ask a parent which ch child yeah. they, is their favorite, they're not going to tell you. <laughs> Some will. <laughs> um, we also have a question from Rhea, who's here. Uh, Rhea. Maybe. We can't see Maybe. it. Oh, back, over we? there. Okay. Hi. I'm also going to ask a question if that's okay. I think this is a really good question, by the way. I love all of these. Um, what is your favorite food, and are you a vegetarian? Well, my favorite food is 
some kind of green vegetables. Um, that those I like. I really like those. Um, and I'm. I was a vegetarian starting from the late 1960s, as soon as I learned about factory farms. Mm -hmm. And I'm now, when I possibly can, I'm a vegan, because moving towards a plant-based diet is a super way to help make the planet a kinder place. You. you know, um, it's, it's, the, it's not just the, the animals we eat, it's the dairy and, and um, egg yeah. production that is so cruel. Yeah. You know, the poor mothers, they have these calves. And cows, if, if you leave them, there's a real strong bond between the mother and child. Yeah. And they take them away sometimes just after they're born. And I was in one place, and it was awful all night long. The mothers were calling and the children were calling, and they, they'd been separated. And it was just awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a friend who grew up on a farm who said the same thing. Even with that direct proximity to it, they just said this, that sound is seared into their memory yeah. so clearly. And by the way, when you get home, if you haven't seen it um, or after this, just Google not Picasso the artist, but Pig Casso. <laughs> and Pig Casso wasn't originally called that. It's the importance of naming, isn't it? But yeah. she was rescued on her way to slaughter. She was going to become bacon. And she was rescued by an artist who had started a little sanctuary for farm animals. And the artist noticed that this pig was fascinated when she was painting. So one day she set up an easel and some pots of paint and put a paintbrush with paint in Picasso's mouth. And she started making things. If you Google it, she is so excited to get to this canvas, and she chooses her own colors, and she fills the canvas. Now, her paintings are selling for $5,000. Oh <laughs> and she has, had, she has had two international exhibitions. <laughs> and the only thing she's been taught is at the end of a painting, when she's finished, she dips her snout in red and gives a, a, snout, well. a snout sign. But, you know, here's the point of naming. All the pigs have the same type of personality. Mm. They don't have names, they're thrust into factory farms, and they're eaten. Yeah. Um, I have another question for you here from someone called Blooming Old on Instagram, which is, just you mentioned your mother so much, I think, it, I think it's natural that people would be asking this, it's so beautiful. What is the best advice that your mother ever gave you? The best advice yeah. is what I've said. She said, if you really want to do something, you've got to work hard, yeah. take advantage of every opportunity, and don't give up. Mm. I don't think there's any better yeah. advice than that. Yeah. And then I have one last question from Nicole, who is watching via the live stream, who wants to know, for your 89th birthday, what is one positive action that we can all take to improve the world? Well, because everybody has a different capacity mm. to change the world. I mean, I could just say plant a tree or um, try to move to a plant-based diet or something, but I'm going to say something different. I'm going to say, just remember, every single day that you are on the planet, you make an impact, and you can choose what sort of impact you make. For example, what do you buy? Mm. Uh, where did it come from? Did its manufacture harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages? Uh, if so, don't buy it. Mm. And that's just one example of what you can do each day. How do you treat people? When you walk past somebody in the street who's homeless, do you look away? Mm. Or do you see if you can make some contact? And they've told me, if somebody smiles at me, I'd rather have a smile than a dollar. And so, you know, think about how you can make the world a better place. Um, do you bother to water dying plants? L little things yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. you know? And then if we put all these actions together, small actions can cumulatively move us towards a world that's better. But, you know, there are some people, and I, some people who are billionaires, 
And if they say, what can I do to make the world better? I'll say, write out a big check to the Jane Goodall yeah. Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Goodall, thank you so much. This has been such a privilege. I know that we, as you said, it was your birthday yesterday, and I think it's very befitting if we all maybe get together and sing a little song, but we would also like to toast you. I kept on reading in every single interview, you mentioned your love for whiskey. Yeah. So we have some whiskey here. She already has some up on stage. Um, I think we're going to bring out some whiskey to toast you. Let's, let's see if I, can, if I can do this. Do you want to start singing happy birthday while I pour this out? Okay, okay, ready? I can't start. There we go. Okay. She's not a whiskey drinker. <laughs> <laughs> it's strong. It's strong. I, w I tried to find what was the most ecologically sourced and environmentally friendly um, whiskey, and I was told that it was Scotch. It was Glenfiddich, and I was like, "Oh, you're going to have that's too close to home." So this is an American whiskey that is it's apparently very good. Okay, good. Yes. Good. It's good. Good. Good for good. America. Okay. <laughs> Makes America great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so, so much. We are almost ready to close, but before we do, I, there was just a couple of things I wanted to really quickly mention. So one is that um, here at the Brooklyn Museum, there is the Climate and Crisis exhibition up on the fifth floor, which is incredible. And the museum, as if it already hasn't been generous enough, has actually decided to keep the exhibition open for all of you to just head up and go and have a little private, semi-private um, viewing this evening, which I think is absolutely wonderful if you get a chance to go and do that. But first, I just have one more question, which is a question for all of you. Um, now, Dr. Goodall, you famously said, let us use the gift of our lives to make this a better world. So I'm going to ask everyone here to pause and think about who inspires you all to make this a better world. It's going to be a little bit um, of a mess and a little bit cheesy, but I'm going to have everyone say out loud someone who they believe inspires them to make the world better on the count of three. Um, Okay, are you ready? Do you want to do the countdown, Dr. You Goodall? Do it. Okay, okay. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Wait, thank you no, so much, no, Dr. I want, Goodall. I want, can I do one last thing? Yes, of okay. course you can. You so can I w this is where I want to involve all of you. Okay. So you've heard what I had to say, or some of what I would say. Uh, and if you agree with me, I want you to join. So... In Tanzania, where Roots and Shoots began, about four years ago, I went back to Tanzania, and sometimes we bring young people from around the city to come together and share their projects and have fun. And I found that at the end of a the day, they were standing together and saying, together we can, meaning we can save the world. And so I said, yes, we can. We know what we have to do, but will we do it? Do we have the will? And so then they started saying, together we can, together we will save the world. And I said, yes, because together we must. So if you agree with this, could you stand up and join me? And we will repeat together after one, two, three. This is much okay. better. <laughs> one, two, three. Together, together we can. can. Together, together we, we will. will. Together, together we, we must. must save the world. Thank you. Yeah.